Hello everyone, Pierce Delahunt here, activist educator. I combine the interpersonal social emotional learning with the institutional socialist political economy stuff. I would like to actually begin with a prayer. This is something that I try to hold in my heart every way I can, and I offer it to y'all. Earth universe, with your discretion, I pray that the oppressors within and among us find slash create the means to remove the barriers to acting in solidarity, that the oppressed within and among us find slash create the means to sovereignty and self-determination, and that we all find slash create the means to spiritually, emotionally, mentally, and physically realize collective liberation. Amen. I'm also going to offer a land acknowledgement here where I live in California on Greater Turtle Island. There has been a tremendous land theft, and one of the surest ways that we can address that is through land tax. I myself pay a land tax to the Sugar Ate Land Trust, which is relevant to where I am in California. If you are on land that has been stolen, I promise there is a way for you to pay a land tax somewhere. You can see here a map of the ongoing land theft that is occurring. It is not something that is strictly past tense. And if we want land justice, then one of the surest individual actions we can commit to is a land tax. Okay, getting into the content of this presentation, one thing I want to emphasize is that mainstream social emotional learning has a glaring problem in not addressing systemic injustice. Most social emotional learning begins at the level of one-on-one -on -one interactions in an equal power and privilege setting, which is a fine place to begin. It is a terrible place to end and to pretend that all interactions are at that level. Fundamental questions missing from mainstream social emotional learning include how do we show up well in conflict with people who have more power and privilege than we do, or less power and privilege? How do we show up well in group relationship? What about group conflict? What about when I am the person who is most affected by the conflict? What about when I am not the person who is most affected by the conflict in a group setting? And now we're in what are traditionally called political social justice questions, all coming from the question, what does it mean to be in right relationship? And if you are looking for something more along those lines, then I recommend my other video, Social Emotional Learning for Social Justice, whereas this video will be getting more into nonviolent communication itself. I will be making reference to systemic injustices throughout, and a lot of my teaching of nonviolent communication is for activist organizers, and I work with them on examples. But this content here is going to be more specifically about nonviolent communication itself. Okay, nonviolent communication. What is it? First, let's begin with what it is not. Nonviolent communication is not tone policing. Number one, I want to get that very clear. A lot of people do have a kind of NVC trauma around trying to bring accountability to a person and that person responds by saying you're not using nvc with me i dismiss everything you say and that is not actually what we do in nonviolent communication i'll be blunt they're using bad nonviolent communication they're using violent communication if you find that someone is tone policing you that is just a way to dodge accountability that is not actually adherence to nonviolent communication Nonviolent communication is also not, or rather is so much more than what we typically think of when we think of nonviolence. Nonviolent communication is so much more than just being nice to people. That's not what it's about. And it's not about not saying mean things. A lot of people have this idea that nonviolent communication or even just nonviolence in general is about being nice and not being confrontational. Whereas nonviolent communication, and I would argue nonviolent direct action and other forms of nonviolence are deeply confrontational. The very concept of nonviolent communication is to confront and face the feelings and needs that we have have and the feelings and needs that other people have so that we can work on getting those needs met. That's the concept and we'll talk more about that. But fundamental to that is confronting and facing those things and being honest about them and taking responsibility for our own feelings and needs while also making sure that we do not take responsibility for other people's feelings and needs, which is actually a form of avoiding confrontation. 
if I take everything on from other people, then I never have to face what I'm responsible for, which includes my own boundaries. And part of the structure of nonviolent communication is that it gives us a framework to have those conversations, a way to navigate that confrontation. So in a dominant culture that is sometimes called conflict averse, but war prone, we like to avoid uncomfortable conflict until we can really go to war with someone. Nonviolent communication is actually very pro confrontation earlier on so that we can navigate that in a more healthy way. I think part of that comes from a feedback loop in our media where we're not actually used to seeing examples of healthy conflict modeled for us. But nonviolent communication does not mean that everyone is comfortable or even getting along. It's actually more about you having a deeper relationship with yourself and then that deeper relationship extending to relationships with others. And finally, nonviolent communication is actually not really about communication. We talk about the words that we say as a proxy for talking about the consciousness that we use to move through the world, because it's a lot harder to talk about consciousness than it is to talk about the words we say. But I can say the words, I love you, in a way that is, for one, a lie, and for another, manipulative or not actually being open and honest. And I can also say the words, hey, douchebag, in a way that actually engenders relationality and connection and intimacy and vulnerability. So it's not actually about the words that we say, but when we talk about communication, we're talking about the words that we say. So it's much more important to understand that when we talk about the words, it's actually more about the spirit or the consciousness with which we are communicating with someone. But it is helpful practice to return to the words to try to imbue your whole self with that spirit. It's a helpful way to practice embodying it. Okay, so what is nonviolent communication? Marshall Rosenberg, the founder of nonviolent communication, defines the purpose of nonviolent communication as creating the quality of connection such that everyone's needs get met. That's two part there. We create a quality of connection so that everyone's needs get met. That's the goal, but sometimes the quality of connection comes with a lot of ease, or it can take years to develop and then get to ease. So I can have a relationship with some people where we don't even need to say words to each other. Something happens and we just look at each other and we know what we need to do. There's a strong quality of connection there and we can get our needs met. Sometimes the connection takes a little more work and that's fine. It just means that we have to learn how to communicate that. And so in doing that, maybe I will assume something about what would meet your needs and you might assume something about what would meet mine. And then it's just about communicating around those assumptions to figure out where the misunderstandings took place, presuming that everyone is acting in good faith, of course. And there are ways to deal with people who are not acting in good faith in nonviolent communication. And we'll talk about it. So that is nonviolent communication, but I'm titling this video somatic nonviolent communication. So what do I mean by that? The word somatic just refers to the body and calling it somatic nonviolent communication emphasizes that these feelings and needs live in our bodies and that we need to be in relationship with our bodies in order to know what our feelings and needs are. I'll be referring to that throughout, but I want to emphasize that upfront. Okay, so the actual heart of nonviolent communication is what we call needs. Everyone has needs. Everything that we do and everything that we say is for the purpose of meeting a need. That's the entire concept of all behavior under the model of nonviolent communication. Needs are the thing that gets centered. But needs aren't the only thing that matter. It's also true that feelings and observations matter. We can use the feelings as a clue to figure out what the needs are. If I'm feeling really good about something, that's a good indication that my needs are being met. If I'm feeling really bad about something in whatever kind of way, that's a really good indication that my needs are not being met. So under nonviolent communication, feelings are really helpful in that they indicate what our needs might be. Same with observations, including sensations, and we'll talk about those, are really good indicators of what is happening that is meeting or not meeting my needs. Now, I mentioned before that nonviolent communication is a lot about taking responsibility for our feelings and needs. And the framework that I like to use for that is thinking about finding a baby on your doorstep. The analogy being that we are not responsible for having put a baby on our doorstep, but we are now responsible for the fact that there is a baby on our doorstep. I don't have a moral responsibility to not be angry at things or to not be sad at things or to not have anxiety about things, but I do have a responsibility 
responsibility for addressing those feelings as they arise in me. And that includes a responsibility to be honest with myself about what feelings are arising for me. So I can try to convince myself, oh, I'm fine, I'm just not going to worry about it, but that is inflicting a kind of violence on myself. Another point here that I want to make regarding the way needs work, both in one-on-one -on -one relationships as well as group relationships, is that any one need that is not being met over time will deplete all the other needs as well. So we can start with a seemingly less fundamental need like play. So if in my relationship with you, my need for play and fun just never gets met, and I make requests to try to meet those needs, and you just keep telling me no, or maybe you even tell me yes, of course, and then do not follow through on the request, over time, my need to be heard in our relationship will not be met. And then over more time, my need for trust will not be met. Then over more time, my needs for fairness and justice will not be met. And that's all from one need in one relationship. So when you amplify that to many needs in group relationship, you can see how interpersonal relationships are actually deeply entwined with institutional relationships. The personal is political and the interpersonal is institutional. Now, if we're looking at this like a dartboard, we're trying to throw the dart at needs. But if we throw the dart and we totally miss, it hits the wall, then we're in the realm of moralistic judgment. So these are four really big moralistic judgments. We have good, bad, right, wrong, should not, and good and evil. And the point about emphasizing that moralistic judgments are not on the board is not to say that moralistic judgments are bad. Then we'd be using moralistic judgments about making moralistic judgments, right? The point is that moralistic judgments aren't actually going to help us meet our needs. In fact, a big part of why we often make moralistic judgments is because we're overwhelmed with a feeling. And then making a judgment is actually a way to quiet down that feeling, which is to say that even if the judgment is correct, one of the things that we are doing by making that judgment is suppressing our feelings. So if someone acts in a way that I find upsetting for whatever reason, I could say, oh, forget them, they're just a big jerk, which may be true in some model of what it means to be a big jerk. But what I'm doing is I'm saying, I don't need to work through the feelings that it brings up for me because that person doesn't matter. And whether or not that person, quote unquote, matters, I need to work through the feelings that it brings up in me. So there's a kind of actually self-violence in making these moralistic judgments because then I am saddled with feelings that come from unresolved needs that are then going to be unconsciously guiding me. And I might act out in a way that doesn't actually meet my needs. So that's a big part of why moralistic judgments don't help us meet our needs is that they don't help us move the feelings through our bodies in a mindful way. They actually leave the feelings stuck in us. And I want to be clear here that this is true even in matters of social justice. I may think that you said or did something racist or sexist or in some way harmful. And that judgment may be true, but I still need to figure out the feelings in me. I can't just say, oh, well, you're a racist anyway, so I don't need to think about the feelings that move through me. But that is what we often do. We often say, oh, that's a racist thing to say. And then we don't think about it any more than that. When really we need to be moving, be addressing the feelings in ourselves in order to know how to better address and navigate what to do in community. And now this may look like a really simplistic way of framing everything. And in a lot of ways it is, but I want to emphasize that this is actually deeply counter to everything that we are enculturated with. Our social infrastructure goes completely against this. How often do you think or ask or hear someone ask, hey, I wonder if this meets my needs. Would it meet your needs if I did this? Do you know how you feel about this? How could we meet your needs if we were to do something like this? Versus questions like, is this good? Is this bad? What do you think? Should I be doing this? Isn't that wrong though? Those kinds of questions versus questions that connect us to our needs. And that brings me to two quotations that I really love. One is from the founder, Marshall Rosenberg, who says, people connected to their needs make very bad slaves. And one of the points here that he's making is that if we are all connected to our needs and have a deep relationship with them, it's going to be very hard for me to convince you to act against your needs, to do something that would violate the needs of your own or the needs of your loved ones. 
Whereas if you are not connected to your needs and you don't have a good relationship with them, you're not really sure what they are, maybe you don't even have a good relationship with your feelings, it is going to be much easier for me to turn around and say, actually, if you do this thing, then it will be good. Because now we're in the realm of moralistic judgments. If you let them do that thing, that will actually be evil. And let me explain to you why. I have this graph here and these two lines intersect over here. And that means that doing this thing that you think is good is actually really bad. And so now we need to go and violate our needs and the needs of other people. But if we have a deep connection and relationship to our needs, it's going to be much harder to convince us otherwise. And that is one reason why Marshall Rosenberg calls the mainstream language of moralistic judgment a language of domination, because it serves the interests of subjugating our needs to the strategies of people in power. And then the other quotation that I want to offer comes from Angela Watrous, who's a nonviolent communication practitioner. And she says, it is when we are disconnected from feelings that our strategies most suck. Now, how often do we hear the value of putting feelings aside and thinking logically, a kind of detached logic bro framework of thinking, or we mustn't be sentimental about this. We have to be reasonable. We have to be rational. It is when we come at a conflict with that kind of frame that we are most often about to engage in something harmful. Feelings are our body's way of communicating information to us. And that information is often incredibly valuable. It doesn't mean that they don't need to be investigated, but it does mean that if we say, no, I'm not going to pay any attention to my feelings, that we are ignoring really valuable information. Now, on that note of valuing our feelings while still investigating them, it's worth talking about discomfort because just because we are uncomfortable with something does not mean that anything is wrong. And in fact, there is a framing called solutions privilege, this idea that anytime discomfort or tension arises, we have to do something right away to solve the tension and solve the problem. When often what we actually need to do is sit with the discomfort and build a relationship with it so that we can make mindful decisions that consider the needs of everyone rather than reacting from a place of centering our discomfort so that we can stop being uncomfortable in a way that actually might violate someone else's needs who needed to be more centered in that situation. So we talked about feelings as clues of whether our needs are being met or not met. And if we break it down more than just feeling good or bad, we can actually get a lot of information just from four feelings, glad, sad, mad, and afraid afraid. So if I feel glad, that's a really good indication that my needs are met. And what do you do when your needs are met? You celebrate. That could be something as simple as a high five or expressing appreciation by saying thank you, or it could be really extravagant and you throw a big party with all of your loved ones. If you feel sad, that's a really good indication that your needs are either unmet or that you have lost a strategy to meet a need, in which case the actions to take are to mourn the loss. And in nonviolent communication, mourning is actually a need, which I love that it is named that. And you will also need to figure out a new way to meet those needs. You don't need to rush to that. Going through the sometimes lengthy process of mourning is actually one of the surest ways to learn how to meet that need again. And if we feel mad, that's a really good indication that our needs have not just been unmet, but that they have been violated. And when that happens, we need to set a new boundary to ensure that our needs are not violated again. And then finally, if we're feeling afraid, that's a good indication that our need has not yet been lost, but that need is being threatened. And in that case, we need to protect. Sometimes that means setting a new boundary as when we feel mad. Sometimes that means ensuring that the boundary is not going to be crossed or some other way to protect the need. So if you're ever feeling stuck around what you're feeling or what to do, I really recommend taking a look at just these four. I think they're a really great framework to begin to make sense of something if you're not sure where to go. But there's a lot of lists out there. This is actually my favorite feelings and needs list, partly because of the way it's organized. And also there's a pretty colored illustration on it. And if you ever want to figure out what your needs are and you don't have the words, it's a good reference point. The key with determining whether something is a need is the question, is it universal or not? Because every single person on the planet has the need for connection and every single person on the planet has the need for autonomy. But not every single person on the planet meets those needs in the same way. The example I like to use is that a car is a really popular vehicle huh, to meet both those needs, autonomy and connection. 
but not every single person on the planet needs a car. Now, the universality of needs also means that no need is ever tied to a particular person. So while I may really want you to do something, I don't have a need for you to do or say anything in particular. Of course, it is true that if you do something, it may be much more meaningful and do much more to meet my needs than if someone else did that same thing. For instance, if a family member or a loved one or anyone that we have a deep relationship with were to demonstrate their love and care, it would generally mean much more and meet our needs more than if a stranger tried to demonstrate their love and care for us. At the same time, nonviolent communication asks us to acknowledge that we just cannot make people do things. One practitioner whose book I link in the resources shares a story about their mom not being able to honor their request, and so they sought to meet those unmet needs by going to their aunt instead. Now, it may take more from the aunt to meet those same needs than it would have from their mom, or alternatively, it may take a lot of casual acquaintances to do something small to meet the same need than if a loved one were to do something. If you think of your needs as cups and everybody has a little bit that they can pour into, some people might be able to offer more. You might prefer some people to be filling your cup, but you can still meet your need or fill your cup by going to other people. Universality also means that we all have the same needs. They're all met or unmet or triggered by different things. And what meets or unmeets those needs comes from a dialectic relationship between us and the environment we're in. As an example, I have the same deep need for order that conservatives do. I just choose to meet that need through the strategy of organizing my Google Drive folder and my sock drawer rather than by imposing it on poor immigrants of color, which they could be doing too. But they have learned to meet those needs in other ways. So when those ways are not happening for them, it unmeets their needs. So if you see someone complaining about immigration, you can tell them, organize your sock drawer instead. Now, though not every single person on the planet meets their same needs in the same way, I want to put a big asterisk on that because capitalism is really effective at alienating us from strategies that do not profit it and really effective at rendering us dependent on strategies that do profit it. And that is why the number of cars sold every year go up and up and the number of self-sufficient farmers is dangerous dangerously low. But part of the value of being in deep relationship with your needs is the openness to other strategies as you pursue the one that you've decided on. If we're not in deep relationship with our needs, we risk attachment to the strategy that we're pursuing and not seeing the other strategies that are opening up as we go along. So that is one list of needs. These are some feelings that we typically experience when our needs are being met. And as you can see, again, they're organized in a way that I find helpful. And these are some feelings that we typically experience when our needs are not being met. One thing that's important to name here is that there is some debate over what counts as a feeling or not. For instance, some people think that guilt is a feeling, but that shame is not. And there are a variety of other questions along those lines. But one of the bigger threads of figuring out whether something is a feeling or not is whether it is actually a judgment of what someone else has done to us. For instance, if I say I feel insulted, what I'm actually saying is that I am judging that you insulted me. Whereas when some people insult me, I don't care. And when some people insult me, I feel really sad. The example that Marshall Rosenberg likes to use is the concept of feeling ignored. Because sometimes when people are ignoring him, he feels great relief. And other times when people are ignoring him, he does feel sad. So it is worth taking that extra step if you think you've landed on a feeling to figure out, is this really a feeling? What else might be going on there? And to be clear, part of the value of that distinction is in not activating any anyone's defensiveness when we're describing how we feel. It actually gets at the separation between impact versus intent. If I say I feel insulted or I feel attacked, I'm saying that you're insulting or attacking me. And that might not be their experience as the person doing or sending energy to me. So just because my experience is one of being attacked or insulted, it doesn't mean that they're not going to get defensive if I try to express that. Whereas if I say, I feel sad or hurt when I hear you say such and such, they'll be much more likely to hear and receive that. Now on the flip side, if someone is sharing with us the impact of our own behavior and they say something like, I feel insulted or attacked right now, 
it's important that we don't just shrug them off and saying, well, that's not a feeling, so I don't care. We may notice ourselves getting defensive in response to what they're sharing. And that may be a dance between making space for our feelings so that we can hear them on our own and also saying, hey, I'm trying to hear you. But when you use words that describe intention, like insult or attack, I just feel the defensiveness coming up in me. Can you just share your own feelings, please? And hopefully they can hear that. So that's one of the distinctions that we need to practice under nonviolent communication, but there are others. I offer here three of the bigger ones. Now we already talked about needs versus strategy, the main tension being universality, and we already talked about feelings and non-feelings, the main tension there being whether it is a judgment. And you might use language to cover up that it is a judgment. So you might say, I feel insulted or ignored, but you might also say, I feel that you are being disrespectful right now. That's not actually a feeling. We can presume what feelings might be underlying that, but it is important for everyone to have a familiarity and relationship with the feelings at present. Then the other distinction that is really important for us NVC practitioners is observation versus evaluation. And the guiding tension here is whether the thing in question is falsifiable. And falsifiability is just a fancy word for saying, can it be disproven? If there were a video camera in the room and people were to look at it, could they say, yes, the thing that you claim is happening or not? Or is it something that people argue about? And that exists on a spectrum, right? Maybe I think that you're yelling at me, but someone else thinks that you're not. But the more we can express our observations without evaluation, the more helpful it will be to getting that communication flow happening and then everybody's needs getting met. So in the example of yelling, I might say, I'm hearing you raising your voice with the implication being it's a comparison to how you were speaking beforehand, rather than outright saying you're yelling at me. That's a conversation I have sometimes as a theatrical Italian. Speaking loudly is just how that side of the family communicates with each other. But that can also be really triggering for people. And so it's important to be sensitive to that. Now on the NVC target, when I wrote observations, I said including sensations. Now what do I mean by that? What I mean is you might not know whatever external thing is happening that is triggering the stuff, but you can tell that you're clenching your fists and you can hear the blood pulse through your ears and you can feel your heartbeat loud and you know that you need to pause what's happening. Or alternatively, you may notice that you are wide-eyed and have a big cheese grill on your face. That counts as an observation. But the point is that we have external observations and we also have internal observations that we call sensations. And then the other distinctions that I want to talk about are those of nonviolent action. So one really important concept in nonviolent communication that is actually not talked about quite so much is that of request versus offer. A big theme in nonviolent communication is taking responsibility for our own feelings and needs. That's why we emphasize saying what our feelings are so that we can step into responsibility for those feelings. And one common way that we cover up responsibility for what our feelings and needs are is by framing requests as offers. So if I don't like the way that you're doing something, I might say, oh, here, let me do that for you. I got it. No problem. So I disguise my request as an offer. It sounds like I'm trying to help serve your needs, but what I'm really doing is helping to serve my own. And that's the thread between request and offer is about whose needs is the action serving, which again is not a binary. This exists on a spectrum and that's why it's represented in this tug of war. And then the other distinction in nonviolent communication is that between a boundary and a demand. A boundary is something that I set in order to protect myself. A demand is something I put on you under threat of punishment if you decline. Now there are situations where the two may look similar and they may even be the same consequence. But part of this distinction is that no matter how the other person reacts, it will still be healthier for you to be grounded in the protection of your own needs and boundary setting rather than be trying to get someone. You can also think of it as the difference between self-defense and coercion or revenge. I think another valuable distinction here between setting a boundary and enacting a punishment is that a punishment is something that you intellectually figure out. You have to come up with the thing that will most influence the other person's behavior or your own. Whereas a boundary lives in you. If someone does something and you feel some type of way about it, that's an indication that that boundary is not being honored. And so to honor that boundary, you now need to maybe remove yourself from the situation. If someone is talking to you in a way you don't like, you may need to say, hey, I need to leave the room so I can resource myself. That's a boundary. 
punishment would be if you keep speaking to me the way you're speaking to me, I'm going to beat you up so that you stop speaking to me like that. And that'll teach you to ever speak to me like that again. So with the frame that boundaries live in our bodies rather than something that we come up with, a lot of the self-work involved in nonviolent communication is about learning who we are so that we can better honor who we are and make more mindful decisions if there's something about our boundaries that we do want to change. And then finally, a big distinction we have is that between celebration and reward. This one is also really under discussed and that's why I emphasize it here. You may be thinking of celebration and reward as the same or similar, but the concept of celebration is about expressing appreciation. And the concept of reward is about influencing other people's behavior, or often enough your own. So the point is not to try to control or manipulate yourself or other people, but to freely and sincerely express appreciation as it arises. And again, under capitalism, it is really easy to impose this kind of framing on ourselves, thinking, oh, I'll let myself have the good thing as a reward when I go through the difficult thing. My suggestion is not that you never delay gratification, but rather that you are grounded in your own self-appreciation and the fact that your needs matter just by virtue of their own existence, rather than they only matter if you are a productive member of society and then you get a little treat. So those are what I consider to be the key nonviolent distinctions to help you navigate how you relate to your own feelings and needs and those of others. Now I know that can feel like a lot and that you might not even know where to go from here, which is why nonviolent communication offers this formula. Now the point is not that you need to always speak like a robot. The point is that this is a helpful guide for you to figure out how to express yourself. So when I see or hear observation, I feel this feeling, I'm needing some need, would you request? And again, the request could be as simple as, would you hear me when I say thank you? In which case we just normally say thank you. Or would you receive my high five? In which case we just say high five. But the point is going through the steps of observation, feeling, need, request, and being really clear on what they are. Now, Marshall Rosenberg does offer what I call step not or step zero. I don't know where he got this number, but he says you get 40 words of background introduction. So in the case of someone being triggered by a raised voice, you might say, growing up in my family, when someone raised their voice, it meant that we were in physical danger. So when I hear you raise your voice, I feel scared and I'm unable to hear what you're saying because I'm needing some assurance that I am safe. Would you be willing to repeat what you're saying without raising your voice? For example, now one thing I want to make clear is that I don't think that people should have to divulge their trauma in order to be heard. And it is also true that sometimes when we divulge our trauma, people can better hear us. So I leave that to your discernment. It's a discernment call. And a reminder here that nonviolent communication in general and this formula are abstractions or intellectualizations about the stuff that lives in our body. So you don't need to say to your roommate, hey roommate, when I see spilled water on the table, I feel sad because I'm needing more cleanliness would you hand me the paper towel? Unless you're doing that for some playful practice and that can be fun too. But the point here is to examine the energy that we're bringing to our interaction. So when I say, hey, can you pass me the paper towel? Am I in that moment trying to connect with my roommate at the level of feelings and needs? Or am I in that moment objectifying my roommate as a strategy in order to clean up a small water spill? That may be a silly example, but I hope I'm making the point here. One thing on that is that judgments do not just live as verbal expressions, but also as imagery. An example of that, one time I was talking to my therapist about a tough working relationship that I had, and I said something along the lines of, I don't have these judgments about this person, I'm just really frustrated with them. And my therapist asked me, when you imagine them, what do you see? And I said, oh, well, I see a snarling trauma monster. And they said, okay, well, let's work with that imagery. So sometimes it's good to check on the feelings in your body and the imagery you're carrying as well as the words you're using. But one suggestion that I offer for you that may be hard for you to hear, presuming that you're watching this because some people's behavior is upsetting for you in some kind of way, is that if you are new to nonviolent communication, even if you're not using the formulaic language, when you're asking people to change something about their behavior while they feel this formulaic stilted energy from you, they're not going to love that. Especially if there's history there, 
even if you no longer have the judgment behind it, it's very likely that they will still hear judgment and critique behind your words. And that's a whole conversation you can have about that too. But my honest suggestion, if you're new, is to begin by practicing appreciation. And you may be thinking you don't need to practice appreciations, but I would strongly suggest you investigate that. There's a beautiful story that Marshall Rosenberg shares in the Nonviolent Communication book. It's actually toward the end where he talks about appreciations, which I think narratively makes a kind of sense, but for the purpose of practice is actually a little backward from how I would do it. But he tells this really lovely story about a participant coming up to him after the end of a workshop, and she says, Marshall, you're brilliant. And in that moment, he could have simply said thank you and left it at that. But the whole workshop was about trying to practice nonviolent communication. So he said to her, I can hear that you're trying to express some kind of appreciation for me, but I'm afraid that people telling me what I am has never helped me connect to them. So she responds, well, you're just so insightful. And again, he says, I'm afraid again, you're telling me what I am, but I don't feel that connection with you right now. Can you begin by telling me what I said or did to help you have this appreciation for me? And she says, oh, Oh, yes, of course. Well, you said this thing and this thing. And when I heard the things you said, and she looks at her feelings list, and she says, I felt hopeful and relieved. And Marshall says, yes, okay, that really helps me connect to your experience and understand your appreciation. Can I ask what needs were met by my saying those things? And she explains, I have this teenage child and I've had a hard time connecting with them. And when you said those things, it met my need for hope that I might be able to connect with them. And that's when Marshall Rosenberg was able to more deeply understand the appreciation that that person was trying to express. So I hope that you can see how nonviolent appreciations are so much more deeply connective than the kind of complimenting that we're used to giving and receiving. Complimenting which is often a subtle form of manipulative rewards, by the way. So if there's some relationship that you're struggling with, I would emphasize practicing those appreciations and developing that connective relationship so that when you bring up a request, they'll be all the more likely to hear your feelings and needs rather than the judgment that they would then become defensive against. Now, okay, let's say that you've gone through all of that and you've made your request and they're still just saying no. One of the frameworks of nonviolent communication is that a no to a strategy is a yes to a need. So if you can hear the need they're saying yes to, and hopefully they can work with you a bit on this, maybe you can figure out how to meet their and your needs together. Talking about responsibility for our feelings and needs, there's also a way that we will sometimes use more superficial needs as an excuse to avoid talking about the deeper, more fundamental needs. I know someone who does vegan outreach, and when they talk to people about going vegan, they'll always give reasons that they don't want to, often saying things like, no thanks, I need my protein. But when they say that, the person I know often responds with something like, okay, let's say that you can get all the protein you need, would you go vegan then? And almost invariably, whatever their first reason was is never the thing that's really stopping them from agreeing. If you're curious with the vegan conversation, it's often actually about alienating relationships from loved ones. And it is only by bypassing those initial responses that we can get to that real heart, which for a lot of people is, if I agreed to live a less harmful life, I would have to confront the fact that my loved ones are not. And again, those are feelings and needs that we need to confront. Speaking for myself personally, I know that a big reason that I avoided looking into veganism or leftism for a long time was actually because I knew that if I were convinced, then I would be one of those weird people. Until eventually, once I did engage in those conversations, I had to confront all that, and now here I am making YouTube videos. So reviewing some of the nonviolent tools that we have, we talked about the nonviolent communication target that centers needs, but also includes feelings and observations. And we talked about the formula, the observations, feelings, needs, requests. We went through the things that we're distinguishing between and how to make those distinctions. And then I'm also going to offer three more tools for you. One is paraphrasing, which we can either offer or ask for. So if I were to ask for a paraphrase, I might say something like, can you tell me what you heard me say? Just so I know that we're communicating clearly, or just so that I know that I've made myself clear. If I were to offer a paraphrase, importantly, I would try to paraphrase at the level of feelings and needs. So rather than telling someone the whole story that they just told, me, I might say something like, what I'm hearing you say is that you're really feeling blank because what someone did left you needing more blank. 
Then I also have here I statements, which is another really great tool to fall back on if you're ever stuck. So rather than throwing out accusations, you made me do this, you said this thing, you did this thing, just stick with I statements. Ground in your own self, in your own experience. I saw or heard you say or do this, and I am feeling this type of way. And then finally, a really valuable tool is giraffe ears. And what do I mean by that? Sometimes nonviolent communication is called giraffe language. This is because giraffes have the largest heart of any land animal because they need to pump the blood all the way up their really long necks. Hashtag structural engineering. But the idea is that no matter what anyone says to us or throws at us, all we hear are their observations, feelings, needs, requests. So someone running up on you and yelling at you and I can't believe you just did that. You ruined my whole day. We don't need to accept their gift of all those judgments. All that we hear is I am feeling upset because the action that you did makes it harder for me to my needs. So would you be willing to blank? And if we're noticing that they're yelling or name calling is making it harder for us to hear their feelings and needs. We can say something like, I care about your feelings and needs, but I'm having a hard time hearing what they are the way you're talking to me. Could you please rephrase that? Of course, there are different ways to do it in different moments, but that's the idea. And a key part of this is actually using giraffe ears on ourselves. So imagine going through life and never hearing any insult that anyone offers you and all you hear is their feelings and needs. But then imagine going through life and never hearing any of your own insults in your head. How do we talk to ourselves when we make something that we might call a mistake? And if we hear that voice in our heads, you're stupid, you're bad at this, you failed. We can actually talk to the moral judge in our heads and say, I'm here hearing that you're upset about what I did. It sounds like you need some assurance that I'm going to be okay and that I'm competent enough to handle my life. And over time, that judgment will fade away. Instead, we'll just hear, oh, wow, I did something that I realize is not grounded in my integrity. And now I need to mourn that I did not live up to my values. And that's real. Nonviolent communication is not about avoiding confrontation with others or with ourselves. It's actually about facing those feelings and needs so that we can take responsibility for them. But just calling ourselves stupid is actually a way to not face those. Now, I know that this is a lot and it will take a long time to practice these things so that they are deeply internalized within you. So I just want to emphasize the frame that this is a practice. You will mess up. You will make mistakes. You will reach a point where you look back and you realize a lot more mistakes than you thought you were making and you will cringe. That will happen when you practice anything. So I hope that you can lean into patience and care and forgiveness for yourself as you practice and always. Okay, so those are the main nonviolent tools that I offer to you. Now with those in mind and heart, I offer this exercise for you to imagine a conflict. And when I work with activist organizers, I ask them to choose one related to their activism. So you can do the same if you like, and you can do this as often as you like with more than one conflict. And if you choose a conflict related to your activism, I also ask you to be mindful of is the conflict with a person who is an opponent in your activism, with someone that you are trying to recruit into activism, or with a fellow comrade. I think it's really valuable to consider the different dynamics with each type of conflict. But so in this conflict, if you're writing on a piece of paper, draw a line down the middle, and on one side you write down your feelings, and on the other side you write down your need. Now you might find that you can think of one feeling right away very easily, but try to see if there's more than just that one. And the same thing with the needs. See how many layers there are to the conflict. Now, if you're actually doing this, you can pause the video here and I'll give you five seconds to do so. And if you're moving forward, I now ask you to consider the feelings and needs of the other person in the conflict. And again, I'll ask you to pause the video and I'll give you five seconds to do so. So in a group, I would normally debrief with people and we would have some discussion about it. But my main questions for you are, did you learn anything from this? Did this add any valuable insight to the conflict? Some people see how their feelings and needs are tied up in a way that they didn't before. Some people realize that their feelings and needs are actually the same as the other person's feelings and needs. And of course, we don't know what the other person's feelings and needs were for sure. We're just guessing. That's fine. But just check in with yourself. Was this exercise helpful for you? And if not, okay, maybe try again with another conflict. Maybe don't. But you can also practice just going about your day, imagining what another person's feelings and needs are. 
or imagining the feelings and needs of the characters on the TV show or movie you're watching. Practicing both the framing and the connecting will help you for when you actually really need to. And one thing that I love about nonviolent communication framing is the way that it shifts a conflict from being one person against another in trying to do the mutually exclusive things that they want to do and turning that conflict into a puzzle that two people are working on together. And this framing actually makes it more conducive for us to move into deeper relationship with the people that we are in conflict with. Now, of course, if someone is not working with you, you may simply need to set a new boundary. And that is 100% valid. My point here is that I think that this framing will be helpful for the people who do want a relationship with you and whom you also want a relationship with. So now we're going to talk about empathic responses versus non-empathic responses. One point here is that when we're talking about empathy, we're talking about empathizing with those feelings and needs. I actually think that this is a really important point if we are in a relationship with someone whose values we disagree with. If we are choosing to stay in relationship with them, the way that we can navigate that is by empathizing with their feelings and needs, but setting a boundary at not empathizing with their judgments and way of thinking. This is, I think, a common mistake that liberals make when dealing with conservatives. They spend a lot of time trying to, quote unquote, empathize with a conservative way of thinking or moral judgments. And what happens is that the conservative just convinces the liberal of their way of thinking. Offering someone empathy is not a request that they convince us to think like them. And confusing those things is dangerous. Whether or not you choose to be in a relationship with someone like that is completely up to you. I offer that framing for you if you do choose that. I know it has helped me with such people in my life. But so empathic responses might be something like, so it sounds like you're feeling this and needing that. Or asking, are you feeling this and needing that? Or often just sitting with someone in silence. It's really just the being present with someone's feelings and needs that is the most important thing, more than the words themselves. Though often for people to hear that reflected back to them can be really helpful. Compare these to non-empathic responses, which I think in mainstream culture we are way more practiced in. So I might give you advice. I might one-up you. Oh, you think you have it bad. Let me tell you about the time that I went through this. I might just interrupt you, cut you off. I might minimize what you're going through. That's no big deal. That's nothing. Don't worry about it. Just let go. I might psychoanalyze you. Oh, this sounds like you're still dealing with your parent stuff or ex stuff. Oh, you're still attached to that thing, huh? Or I might try to gossip and mine you for information. They said what? No, they didn't. Where I'm just trying to extract information from you about what you or other people said or did. Often enough, you can actually have deep empathic responses to someone without knowing anything about what actually happened. Because what matters most is just the feelings and need. Now, one point here is that these non-empathic responses are not bad. In fact, every one of them can actually be helpful under the right circumstances. The point here is that we're so practiced in non-empathy that we need to distinguish it from what empathic responses are, and we need to practice those to catch up. So in my workshop at this point, I would facilitate us through an exercise called empathy, non-empathy. And the way it would work is that people would pair up and each person would take a turn sharing something that was true for them. One sentence, I'm feeling tired today. And then their partner would respond with one of those non-empathic responses first. Then they would do a different non-empathic response a second time. And then the third time, all with the same one sentence prompt, they would finally offer an empathic response. And then the partners switch, and then we debrief about that experience. What came up when you heard a non-empathic response? What happened in your body when you heard that empathic response? What was it like for you offering the non-empathic response? And how did you feel when you were offering that empathic response? So if you have anyone interested in learning this stuff with you, I really love this exercise. It's a great opportunity to experience how it feels in your body to practice nonviolent communication. Now, before I totally wrap up here, I want to say a word on facilitation. I've been emphasizing this whole time on what to do in one-on-one -on -one interactions, but when we are in a group setting, there's more feelings and needs to navigate. So what I'm offering here is a variation on something I've seen called a game shift board. You don't need to know that. That's just if you want to Google other examples later. But firstly, it's important to remember that you can always pause or stop 
any conversation that you are in, as well as backtrack or skip ahead. And you can always resume right then or days, weeks, or months later. In the moment, remember to keep breathing. And then at a more logistic level, we just want to check in on whether the form of the conversation is meeting the needs of the function. So if the function is to decide a thing, you may need to explore first. And when exploring, you might go popcorn or stacking. But when deciding, you switch to just taking the vote, whether that's by turns or a silent ballot in a hat thing. But what I think is the main reason that meetings can dredge on is that they have finished the exploration and are at the point of decision but don't change the form that the conversation is taking. And then it just becomes people speaking in popcorn style, trying to convince each other of everything rather than just tallying the vote. I know that's much more logistical than nonviolent communication, but we're all facilitators in every interaction we're in. And I hope that I have just saved you hours of being in meetings that are not serving your needs. So finally, I offer you these reflection questions as well as the tree of contemplative practices. I offer the tree because I like to emphasize that not all reflection happens in stillness. Maybe you do your your best reflection in movement or maybe in creative arts. Whatever works for you. And we don't just learn from experiences, we learn from reflecting on the experience, a quotation from radical educator John Dewey. Reflection question A, how do I affirm my own boundaries while honoring those of other people? And you can take a moment to reflect on that. I'll give you five seconds to pause. And then reflection question B, how do I communicate to others that I am as invested in them as I am in myself? And I'll give you a moment to reflect on that. So that is the presentation. I offer you these resources here, and I link to the slides in the description. The lower left is where you can find more stuff about me, as well as some key resources for both nonviolent communication and leftist critical analysis. Now that book, Decolonizing Nonviolent Communication, written by Menachi, is my absolute favorite resource on nonviolent communication. Cannot recommend that one enough. Of course, over here on the right, you have the tried and true nonviolent communication book and workbook, as well as what I consider to be really helpful and key resources. I'm just going to go ahead and describe to you the NVC structural power analysis video. It's an interview with Marshall Rosenberg in which the interviewer says to him, one thing I really like about nonviolent communication is this sense of radical responsibility for creating our own reality. To which Marshall directly responds by explicitly saying, yes, well, I thank you for your appreciation. And as I'm sure you're aware, the concept of being responsible for creating your own reality is often used by people to victim blame. Maybe you've heard some of those critiques yourself. And so I want to be clear that, yes, we create our own reality, but other people create our reality too. And some of those other people are in gangs. And some of those gangs call themselves gangs, and some of those gangs call themselves multinational conglomerates. And to be honest with you, I'm a little more concerned about the gangs that call themselves multinational conglomerates. Because they create our own reality too and have a lot more power. And then finally, here I have a list of resources that aren't strictly nonviolent communication per se, but I think are super valuable contributions to the concept of somatic nonviolent communication. I want to particularly emphasize the work of Johan Hari, who looks at how our institutional relationships create the conditions for depression, anxiety, and addiction. And then also that book, Punished by Rewards by Alfie Cohn. If you are interested in that conversation distinguishing rewards from celebration and how rewards are used to manipulate people, that is an excellent resource. If you were interested in this concept of how empathy can be weaponized in order to convince liberals to go fascist, the ContraPoints video Witch Trials is an excellent look at that. And Philosophy Tube's 20-minute guided ASMR meditation is my favorite meditation that I have ever done. And then finally, I offer you this quotation from Marshall Rosenberg, which he said at a social justice retreat in Switzerland in June 2005, if I use nonviolent communication to teach people to be less depressed, to get along better with their family, but do not teach them at the same time to use their energy to rapidly transform systems in the world, then I am part of the problem. I am essentially calming people down, making them happier to live in the systems as they are. So I am using nonviolent communication as a narcotic. So if you're interested in those more systems-focused conversations, I would definitely ask you to check out my other work. Regardless, I am grateful for your attention. And when I see that people watch my videos, I feel deep appreciation. It meets my own need for contribution to others, as well as assurance that people out there care. And I thank you.